Okay, uh, if everybody can hear me, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Rich Fletcher, and I direct the Mobile Technology Lab at, at MIT D-Lab, and we work with mobile technology, as the name implies. Uh, a large part of our work is actually in global health. So as some of you may know, a large part of the world's population doesn't have any computers or laptops, they only have phones. So our group develops a variety of applications of how you can use a mobile phone to do diagnosis of disease. And uh, we also do some wearables in this area for vulnerable populations. But the other large part of the work that our group does is in the area of behavior medicine, and that is the topic of our talk today. So several hundred years ago, the predominant health problem and the predominant diseases around the world were communicable diseases, infectious diseases, things like uh, diarrhea or uh, cholera. Um, but this has slowly been changing in many countries. And we reached a, an important milestone around the world uh, back in the 1990s. And for the first time, the incidence of non-communicable diseases surpassed the incidence of communicable diseases. So this is a sign that development is happening around the world. And in fact, you could use the sort of uh, perspective of disease as a way to measure development. So you have, for example, in stage one, where you have no control over infectious diseases, then stage two, you start to control infectious diseases, stage three, you see the rise of chronic diseases, and finally stage four, you start to control the chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases. So, of course, different countries are in different stages of development. So the U.S. and Taiwan, for example, are at the beginning of stage four, but of course, many other countries around the world are in different stages, some, some even at stage one, sadly. And so what are these non-communicable diseases? And they are things such as uh, cancer is probably the most well-known, but there's also things like diabetes, different types of cardiovascular disease, and lung disease, which is often the second or third leading cause of death, the uh, COPD, and even things that are related to mental health, like depression. All of these around the world are rising. As you can see, the trend here is a function of time. Um, so it's becoming a, an increasing concern. And part of this is just simply to do the fact that the world's population is aging, um, but it's not just due to age. So what are the causes of these non-communicable diseases? Well, a lot of it is due to genetic factors, which we have no control over, at least not yet. Um, there's also environmental factors and behavior factors. But some of this um, behavior, environmental factors, we have some control over. For example, you have control over um, the smoke in your house, or if you're taking a, a certain route to work, you could choose the one that's less polluted. So we have some control over environmental factors, so I generally like to include that in, as part of our behavior. If you take an example and put together all the different um, risk factors for cancer, for example, you can see that a large part of them are due to behavior, things that you can control, um, such as uh, uh, on risk, like risky behaviors or unhealthy behaviors. But we can't forget the mind as well. So mental health, you know, the brain is, is part of our body after all. So we have to think about, if we really want to talk about health, we have to think about mental health as well. And we have to think about questions like, how do we detect illness in our brain? How do we improve the health of our brain? So these are things that we often don't learn in school or elementary school, and this is something that's starting to be discussed more um, around the world. Some of the biggest uh, um, incidents of, of mental health are anxiety disorders, things like sleeping disorders, uh, and stress. There's also depression and suicide, so depression is the leading cause of disability around the world. Um, and something that's a very serious problem in the US is substance abuse. So the US has a very serious problem with addiction to, to uh, pharmaceutical drugs. A lot of it is prescription medication, but also uh, illegal drugs as well. And in fact, it's become recently the leading cause of accidental death. It surpassed uh, accidents or deaths by gun, and it surpassed deaths by car accidents. So it's a very serious problem. And these drugs include things like opioids, basically painkillers, so drugs for, for managing your pain. Um, sleep medication, so basically taking medication to help you go to sleep. And um, psychostimulants or amphetamines, and uh, some of these uh, are actually needed medically, but unfortunately, 
um, 7% of, of students actually use this just to get better grades without any medical problems. So, so, so drugs are really abused. And so putting all of this together, um, there's an interest in a branch of medicine called behavior medicine. And this started approximately 50 years ago. So these are the people when you go to a hospital that come and counsel you about what you should be eating, maybe you should stop smoking, or you should exercise more. So this is the part of, of uh, healthcare that we call behavior medicine. So for this conference, we want to ask, how can IT help for improving your behavior, or maybe changing people's behavior? So up to now, for dealing with acute diseases, uh, most of the IT and technology has been used in this way. Basically, we have a, some sort of device or machine that's used by the doctor to either scan or, or diagnose disease. So we do some sort of scan on the patient and get some information. But now, so the next question is, for diseases that are caused by behavior, what kind of technology would be useful? So for this, um, We've been working the past 10 years developing a variety of platforms and systems that are essentially feedback loops. So we have, we started out mostly working with wearable sensors. So you have some technology like a phone or it could be some software in the, in the environment that detects some abnormal or some bad behavior um, based on your sensors and using that information then the phone tries to intervene in some way. So the phone could do an intervention, or the phone can also call for help or find some other way to, to maybe um, modify your behavior. So this is now called uh, mHealth, and um, um, it's become quite popular. And we've done a variety of projects in this area, including uh, systems for drug addiction. So we try to um, put wearable sensors on people who have a drug addiction problem. And when we detect stress and craving, we then present some information on the phone that helps, helps them um, distract them or motivate them not to use drugs. We've also done another example is uh, young at-risk mothers, so teenage mothers who have um, behavior problem, like they get very angry. So when they get angry and excited, instead of maybe yelling at their children or hitting their children, we present some intervention to kind of modify that behavior and help teach them coping skills. So the other thing that I'd like to point out is we don't generally think of a phone as a drug delivery device, but it is. So um, every time you get an email or a message, your brain releases a little bit of dopamine. So, so basically that's one, one reason that many of us are, are feel some addiction to, to email and addiction to, to, to our phones. Um, but Phones also deliver emotions, so images and words and videos can be very powerful, especially when there's some, some personal information there. All of these things can be used to help people change the way they're thinking and maybe modify their, their, their behavior. So the other thing I'd like to point out is um, we can extend this architecture to add a doctor. So remember, the phone is your drug delivery device, but the drugs that get loaded onto your phone are controlled by the doctor. So the doctor can prescribe certain messages and he can describe the doses. The, des the messages can be very light and, and friendly or the messages can be very serious and intense. So the doctor can, can dial the dose and modify that in real time and that then is then delivered by the system to the patient. And of course, this can be extended even further. We've done other systems that use crowdsourcing, so you can have other people in the loop, which could be your peer support group, could be your family, etc., that modify um, the system. And this is uh, following the example of, of group group psychotherapy, which uh, um, it, it is another popular way of dealing with certain uh, mental health or behavioral problems. The other thing I'd like to point out is um, I mentioned so far wearables. And wearables are great for certain people, but wearables have limitations. So there are now many wearables being sold on the market, many apps. You can go into an electronic store and find uh, many different colors and models. And they even showed up uh, recently in Happy Meals. So, so for a short time, uh, McDonald's was actually supplying little uh, activity sensor bands with their, with their Happy Meals. But wearables have been getting some criticism because some of the population that really needs this technology is not able to use it. 
So people who may be maybe children, maybe elderly, maybe people with certain mental health problems. So we also want to think about what technologies can we use that do not require wearing anything on your body. So some of the next generation technologies are things that you can embed on the surface of your body or maybe things like a contact lens that which is uh, being developed by Google. But if you think about all the different signals that are in the space, many of these signals can be used to assess health. So of course there's light, there's which you know things like cameras, there's a thermal imaging, there's sound that can measure things like cough, your breathing. Um, then there's different kinds of radio frequencies and there's even smell. So our group in the past has developed um, you know, uh, microwave and different types of radars to measure um, you know, vital signs. Uh, this is some example of the uh, traces. We've also developed uh, camera-based sensors that look at the subtle changes in color of your skin and using that they can, they can uh, assess uh, your, your heart rate and respiration. And we've even embedded this technology so it runs in real time on a phone. And there's thermal imaging, which uh, if, you, if you notice when you come into the Taiwan airport, um, there's thermal cameras that scan everybody as they're walking down the hall to see if, if they have a fever or if they're sick. And if, if your forehead is slightly elevated temperature, somebody will come and, and ask you if you're sick. So all of this can be embedded in things like uh, smart mirrors in your house, so you can stand in front of a mirror and get scanned and we could assess some abnormal problems or health problems. And something that's coming in the future that's being done by other researchers at MIT are, are odor. And this is a very fascinating field. We already know that animals can do this very well. There, you can order dogs in the US um, to help you monitor your blood sugar, to know when epileptic seizure is coming, or skin cancer, or stress. These are all things that, that um, <coughs> dogs can do um, we cannot yet do it with technology, but we're starting to, and there's some interesting work being done in that area. So how do we put all these systems together to help you do behavior change? So I like to think about this picture. So basically, you can think about your life as, you know, across time. So we're at point A, and in the future, you'll be somewhere in the, in, at point B. And there's many different paths that your life can take. Some of those paths might lead you to a healthy state, some might lead to an unhealthy state. So for example, you might, you know, in, in, in 20 years, uh, some of us might have diabetes or high blood pressure. So we'd like to be able to find a way that we can maintain and, and navigate to a healthy state. So I like to think about this system or this problem as, as, a, as a navigation problem. Because we have, throughout our life, every day we make many tiny decisions uh, throughout the day that we're not even aware of. And a lot, a lot of these decisions are sort of, uh, we make unconsciously or, or subconsciously, and um, uh, some of them are even irrational. So it would be very useful, just the way that we use GPS to navigate with our cars, it would be nice to have some navigation system for our behavior. And um, sometimes I call this the self-driving brain. But that's, a, that's one of the projects we've been working on for the past few years. So how do we use and integrate the Internet of Things? So as you know, many people in this room are very familiar with the Internet of Things. Um, all different appliances throughout your house, for example, and in our environment. And we can use all these devices as part of this feedback loop that I mentioned earlier to help modify our behavior. Sense, what, sense our health and then modify our behavior, send us some feedback. So a lot of this can be done through our phone. So basically the phone is our agent. So the phone by itself doesn't have too much power, but it can connect us to things that can, such as people, like maybe your mother or friends, or people who, who can have an influence on your behavior. Uh, it can connect to devices in an environment like a car, or all the devices in your house. And all these things together can be work in an orchestrated fashion to help modify your behavior. So let me give you an example. So there's, there's a hotel in the US called the Even Hotel, which is a real hotel that exists. In every room there, this is a picture that I took from the room where I stayed. Um, every room in this hotel has exercise equipment. It has a, a, a yoga ball, a yoga mat, and these stretchy bungee cords so you can do exercises. It also has a completely controlled environment. You can, you can change the color of the light. You can change the, the music. And the television has 300 channels, but 200 of them are exercise channels. <laughs> so, so you don't have any excuse not to exercise. And 
One device I thought was very interesting is this color controlled light. So I thought if this was in the future, if this was really working with this full feedback loop, the hotel room should be able to know if I'm jet lagged or if I'm depressed and automatically alter the color of the light. So we know that um, if you, if you want to help go to sleep, you can have like a warm reddish color. But if you want to be alert or if you're feeling depressed, you want kind of the blue color. And um, it should be able to do this automatically. So the question is, how does this work in terms of technology? Is it controlled by your cell phone? And I think the answer is no, because there are many proprietary Bluetooth protocols. The way that the industry is emerging is all the data gets streamed up to the cloud, and then the devices in your hotel subscribe to the data in, your, in the cloud. So it's a, and, and, and the hotel asks for your permission when you check in, you, you give them permission to access the data in, in the cloud, your health data. So there's a model of you in the cloud, and that model can then be shared by not just a hotel, but devices in your house, and even other people or, or, or caregivers like your doctor. Um, so this is not very new. Um, many companies are used to having models for people. Um, we're very familiar with like the models for Amazon shopping. You pick a product, you can suggest another product. Procter & Gamble is a products company in the US that has, has, it's a very old company and they have amazing models. They can predict, depending on the weather and your age group, they can say exactly how many bottles of shampoo will be sold that day depending on, on so many different factors. So I think all this is possible with good data. And of course, we can also extend this again with the doctor, so the doctor can also adjust. So maybe in the future, when you go to the doctor, the doctor can prescribe certain settings for your house, and you can change the programming in your house depending on what health condition you have or what you need. And the last thing I want to say is that um, this system can be used for more than just behavior change. So one very important aspect of health is not just what we do, but also how we feel or affect. And I think it's, it's we're, we're starting to learn and becoming more aware that emotion is a very important aspect of our health. Uh, we know that stress makes addiction worse. It, uh, we gain more weight when we're stressed. It makes diabetes worse. So here's a, here's a very famous study. They have two identical m mice who were fed the same exact diet, but the only difference was one mouse was stressed and one mouse was not stressed. The mouse that was stressed gained much more weight. So there are many, many different uh, pathways that um, uh, sort of couple how we feel with different um, processes going on inside our bodies. And these are now starting to be linked to many non-communicable diseases as well, even things like multiple sclerosis um, and obesity, cardiovascular, things that we, we, don't, we don't normally associate with behavior. So there's now becoming a, a people, when I say people, the medical community is starting to uh, appreciate more the value of meditation and things like mindfulness and because we know that it's important to reduce stress. And these things can help with uh, uh, the way we manage pain, the way we manage sleep, uh, provide having more attention, and even things like managing diabetes and addiction. All of this can be done in a natural way you already have this power inside you. We just need to learn it. So we, we could reduce our need for drugs. It's very easy to take a pill, but if we really learn to listen to our body and learn the skill, it's like learning how to play the piano. Um, we can learn the natural therapy for a lot of these diseases that exist. This is a very old field. So yoga, for example, in India is over 8,000 years old. Um, and it's a lifestyle, so it's not just uh, stretching exercises, but it's also your diet, meditation, breathing exercises, it's, it's the whole lifestyle. Um, and we know that a lot of this is, a, the goal for a lot of this is a, to achieve homeostasis and to stay in balance. So in the research field, we're now just starting to understand uh, from a technology point of view, um, we're trying to understand more what is meditation and what's happening physiologically. And 
we're starting to replace some of the very old tools that we've seen like in traditional Chinese medicine or Indian medicine with modern tools. So in the future, you know, it will be as simple as just like standing up and, and being scanned by your, by your mirror. And the last thing I want to say is that I don't think we want to always use technology as, as a crutch. So basically, I think all of these tools, I think about all these tools as training wheels. So you use it for a temporary, you know, for a short time to help you learn your triggers, help you learn what are the things that affect my behavior. What are the things that make me angry? What are the things that make me stressed? Um, what are the things that prevent me from sleeping? So this sort of mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy is part of what technology can do. It's training the person. And then once you know and have these coping skills, you can remove these training wheels and then empower yourself to lead a healthier life. So in summary, I think that the, the future of technology and medicine is not just phones or wearables, but also things like embeddables, um, but also sensors in your furniture, things like your bed or your cars, or maybe even chips in our brain for, for certain conditions. And I think one of the most interesting things is this biofeedback that really helps us understand and become more aware of our bodies. And this by itself will, will go a long way to unlocking the natural potential we have to live a better life and be healthy. So thank you very much. <laughs>